My heart is to see God's people full of passion and the fire of God, hungry for His presence on a daily basis, full of His power and having a positive impact on the world and those around them, living a life of freedom and victory. This is Running With Fire. I want to start with a question today. Who are or who is the most powerful person on the planet? Some will say the President of the United States of America. Others probably say kings, rulers, leaders, top business people, maybe movie stars, even sports heroes. I want to suggest that it actually is none of those. The most powerful people on our planet are pretty much unknown, hidden away in homes and cities and nations all across the globe. Who are these people? These are people who really, truly know how to pray. Why are they the most powerful? Simply because they can access divine power and release it on earth. Today, I want to share with you some more powerful motivations to pray so you can become one of those very powerful people on our planet. Please stay tuned. Last week, we looked at what prayer does for God. And it was just so important because we saw that God loves your company. He just loves you being with Him. You alone with God, just sharing and talking and fellowshipping together. He loves your company. He just loves you so much. He just longs, longs for you and Him to be alone together. We made in the image of God and our primary calling is to have fellowship with Him. Then we saw also that praying for others is intercession and can be the key to your breakthrough. Come with me to Job chapter 42. If you're not getting a breakthrough in your situation, this may be the key that you need to apply. And it's Job 42.10. The Lord restored Job's losses. Remember, Job had lost his health, his finances, everything. But Job restored his losses when, everyone say when, when what? When he prayed for his friends, and these were actually kind of like his enemies because they'd given him a really hard time. So he prayed for these people who hadn't treated him very well. But once he did that, it says, indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. That was his moment of breakthrough. When he prayed, you could say, for his enemies. How many of you got an enemy? Don't raise your hand. Pray for that enemy, all right? Okay, and watch what God will do in your circumstances. So I want to look now at what prayer does for us. It's me focus now for a few moments. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, you know the verse. Call unto me, say it with me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So maybe the single greatest fringe benefit, I call it fringe because it's not a, a primary thing that happens at salvation as such. It's not why you get saved. But a fringe benefit is our ability to pray. But before I look at that, I want to ask you another question <coughs> A really good question, and it's this. What is the main benefit of becoming a Christian? The main, what's the number one reason and value of you being a Christian? You need to be able to answer this clearly, definitively, because it affects so much else in your life. And some people don't quite get the right answer with this one, but the main benefit of being a Christian is that when you die, you get to go to heaven and not to hell. Amen. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The primary reason is not to heal you, restore your marriage, bless your finances. No, he'll, he can do all of that. It's not even to answer your prayers. The primary reason Jesus came was so that when you died, you didn't go to the wrong place of darkness and torment. You would go to heaven to be forever with the Lord. And friends, why it's so important to know this is that when we lose sight of this, sometimes if life is not working out, God's not answering our prayers, He's not blessing us, He's not doing what we thought He should do, we may even backslide, turn away from God, and basically we're saying, God, forget about heaven, I'm happy to go to hell because you're not doing what I want you to do. See, if you don't understand heaven, you see, a person who knows Salvation gets you to heaven. Would never, in their worst nightmare, if disaster was all around, would never consider for one moment the thought of turning away from God. Because they're not going to turn away from heaven. But when we don't understand that, and that's what happens, a lot of people, you know, God doesn't bless them and say, ah, oh, that's God, I'm not going to serve Him. Friends, heaven and hell are at stake. 
Eternity hangs in the balance. So we need to know that's the primary reason. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 19. An interesting verse there. <laughs> you probably need to go home and meditate on this one because it's quite a, a challenging verse with what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if I can find it here somewhere. Where is it? Here it is. All right, here we go. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. In other words, another verse says, we are of all men most miserable. So if we're looking to Christianity just to bless us in this life, in somehow through all of that, we're going to be miserable people. We're living right, we're praising God, we're serving Him, and it's not all happening for us. But friends, it's not just in this life. It's for all eternity. You get to go to heaven. And sometimes Christianity in many churches is, is presented as a gospel of, of blessing. You know, and we, we preach it ourselves. You know, we, God will cause you to be successful and you know, use your gifts and, and, and answer your prayers and, and prosper you and all the rest of it. You know? And I, I believe in all that sort of stuff, but that's minor <laughs> compared to the main thing. You know, the main thing is you get to heaven. Now, God will bless you in between. But hey, say he doesn't give you success. Say you don't prosper. What are you going to You're going to walk away from God? No, no. That's just, that's just a side. The main thing is we get to be in heaven. But what happened? Galatians 5 verse 11 speaks of the offense of the cross. And so when what happens is pastors start preaching hell, somebody will stand up and walk out. They'll get angry. You can't talk about hell. What do you mean I'm going to go to hell? I remember witnessing to a person somewhere along the line, I mentioned hell, and they just got furious. They just, that was almost the end of the conversation. And so what happens, a lot of churches, a lot of people no longer preach on hell. They, know, they, they mention heaven, happy to do that, but they don't want to talk about hell. Why? Because they want, to be, they want the gospel to be attractive, PC, sophisticated. Friends, what was attractive, PC, or, or sophisticated about Jesus hanging on a cross, humiliated before the whole world, Friends, there's nothing sophisticated about the gospel of salvation, of heaven and hell, and Jesus coming and dying for us. To stop preaching heaven and hell is a grave and serious mistake, which I trust by the grace of God, this church and you will never make. I want to come now to four benefits of praying. The first one is access to supreme power. As Christians, one of the greatest privileges that you and I have is we have access to supreme power through prayer. We're in touch with the one who can do absolutely anything. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Luke 137, with God, all things will be, sorry, with God, nothing will be impossible. The U.S. President John F. Kennedy said this. He said, life's not fair. A lot of you sitting there would be thinking, yeah, life's not fair. And he said, it's not fair because only a minority of people are in touch with those who have influence, in touch with those who can pull strings and make things happen. Because getting ahead in life can so often depend on who you know. If you know the right people, you have influence, they can pull strings for you, they get you a job, an approval, maybe be able to get you a residency, an invitation, all kinds of things, because they've got influence. But most people don't have access to that kind of power and those kinds of people. And the poorer your upbringing, the more often you can struggle with having any kind of voice and actually getting ahead. But the good news of the gospel is this, that even if you were raised in poverty, even if you were raised on the wrong side of the street, rejected by society, you have little influence or power. All that means absolutely zero when it comes to being a Christian because the Christianity is a great equalizer. We are all equal in the sight of God. We're all as important as one another in the sight of God. We all, friends, have status. We have influence. We have power through prayer unto the Most High God. And this God, believe me, can pull strings for you. Uh -huh. He can open doors for you because he has influence. He has, I'm in touch with the man and the person who has a, the most influence in this entire world. And he invites me to come and say, Tap, would you tap into my influence? Because I can do things that are going to blow your mind. It's going to shock you what I can do. Friends, all of us. Don't worry about the fact that you can't connect with the, the, the mayor of the city or the, the key businessman or the prime minister. Friends, you've got connections. You've got connections. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
and they can move heaven and earth on your behalf. So we're all on a level playing field. You're as, you're as important to God as anyone who's ever lived. Did you know that? You're important, as important as any president, any king, any ruler, any prime minister. Anyone who, you're as important as anyone who has ever lived. Do you know how important you are? It's un, unbelievable, isn't it? And you have access to supreme power. In fact, God will hear your, your prayers are as important to God, and he'll hear your prayers just as much as he'll hear the prayers of Moses. Prayers of Abraham, David, Joseph, Esther, Deborah, Paul, Peter, even Jesus. That's how important your prayers are, and that's how much access you have to supreme power. Wow. Prayer, friends, has power with God and changes and transforms situation. There was a couple in our church. They had volatile neighbors. The police were being called in all the time. It was just so bad they considered selling their house. And then they must have remembered about the power of prayer. So they decided to pray. And after they prayed, very shortly afterwards, the neighbors were evicted out of the street and out of the neighborhood. And peace came into the area. Well, let's get excited about some of this stuff, friends. This is incredible stuff that God is doing, you know, and, uh, and we need to rejoice within that rejoice. Here's another one. Maybe this one will get you going. A night, remember that night we prayed for people in full-time ministry? We prayed for success, promotion, prosperity. Well, the following week, a lady in our church, would you believe the company she worked with, they doubled her salary? Now, I know if it, if it had doubled your salary, you would have jumped up and clapped and shouted, but it was someone else's salary. <laughs> Thanks, God. What about me? Hey, when you rejoice with others, that's when God will start doing things in your life too. But imagine that, friends, to prayer. <laughs> Everyone's craving for a double salary. Good on you. Boy, you guys are smart. All right. Through prayer, we have access to supreme power. And God hears your prayers as much as he hears anybody else's. Number two, prayer helps us get to know God. You might think, oh, it's not very exciting getting to know God, but knowing God's the main thing. John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they might know him. And there's nothing more important than knowing God. This church is built on a foundation, you have prayer, Holy Spirit, but also a foundation of knowing God and built on the foundation of relationship with God. And that's why some people like our running a fire ministry in that, because it has some of these unique emphases, well, not unique, but these specific emphases that appeal to a lot of people. You know, knowing God is so important because it's, it's a key to moving forward in the Lord. Once you get to heaven, it's all about knowing God. And God's complaint about the children of Israel over and over again was that they didn't know His ways. It says in Psalm 95, 10, they do not know my ways. They love the miracles. Oh, yeah, God part the Red Sea for us. You know, you know, rain down manna from heaven, God, water from the rock, you know, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by day. Oh, God, we love your miracles. They knew the acts of God, but as soon as they had a problem, guess what? They grumbled, complained, and could not trust God. Why? Because they didn't know God. The people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Amen. Do you want to know how well a person knows God? Watch them in crisis. Mm. because when you know God, you can connect with God in a crisis. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you can connect with Him, and you can move through the situation. So knowing God is all important. But how do you, the question I want to ask is, how do you get to know a person? How do you get to know someone? You've got to spend time with that person. So I know a lot of Adrian's ways. I know what she likes to read. I know what she likes to eat, and I'm not going to tell you what that is. I know her opinions. And I know what she really, really thinks about me. I know when I've crossed the line with my preaching, and she's sitting there, and um, she knows to say something, I just look, and I'm like, Jesus, please, the rapture, now. Get me out of here. <laughs> Why do I know her so well? Time together. If you'll spend time with God, 
honestly, you will start to get to know him and it will just change your whole walk with God. It really will. You might say, well, I don't know how to spend time with God. Well, let me make it real simple for you. Get alone. Get in the 24-7. You might say, well, I can't find a time alone. Hey, one o'clock in the morning, we'll find you a slot. I've got influence, all right? I've got access to divine power. I can get you in there at one o'clock in the morning. And then you say, well, what do I do when I get in there? Just say, God, I'm here. That's it. God, I'm here. I want to get to know you. Can you do that? Is that, that, hit that hard? No. And then just go from there. You don't need professional prayers. You know, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God, I want to know. You know, just say, God, I just want. You can pray like that. There's nothing wrong with praying like that. But you don't have to pray like that. Just be yourself. Just talk. You know, when you were dating, you know, how did you get to know the other person? Well, there's a couple of things. There's one, you desperately wanted to be with that person. You know, why to get to know the other person? And the only way you can do it is one-on-one. You see, you can come to church. There's hundreds of people. But, you know, you don't get to know a per- person well when there's so many people around. In fact, when you're courting, you just want to get rid of everybody else. And don't tell them where you're going. Why? So you can have one-on-one time. And that's how you get to know God. It's one-on-one time. Just alone, being in his presence. And, you know, God just, he longs for your presence. You see, so the thing with you and God is that God's love for you is, is unexplainable. He longs for your presence with such intensity you would not believe. He is aching, aching to spend time with you. And the more you love God, the more you'll want to spend time with Him. And friends, I believe for many of you, God's God's waiting for you. He's just waiting for you to come into His presence and for you to spend some time together and just chat away and however you might want to do that. He's waiting. Tell the person next to you, He's waiting for you. Now tell the person on the other side. Imagine that, friends. Just, just um, picture that for a moment. Picture it. God somewhere. Let's, say, let's just use 24-7 room, okay? It doesn't have to be there. Just, just imagine God's in there right now. And he's waiting for you. Not the person next to you. He's just waiting for you. Sitting on a throne or whatever he might be. He's probably just sitting on the sofa, quite frankly. Because it's our God. Just waiting. Checking the time. Gosh, it's been five days. Still hasn't come. Seven days. Just waiting. Agonizing inside. Hurting. You know, yearning, longing. Scripture that says a spirit yearns intensely. God spoke to that me during one of my visitations. He said, the spirit, you don't know how much the spirit yearns for you, longs for you, cries out for you. Would you give him some time and just satisfy the heart of God. It's a great thing to do. You can never outgive God in serving. We know that. You can never outgive Him in thanksgiving. You can out- never outgive Him in giving money. Can I add one more to that? You can never spend too much time with God. Never. The only person who spends too much time with God is those who neglect their responsibilities. So when it comes time for dishes, they say, Oh, the Lord is calling me to prayer. <laughs> How many of you have tried that one? <laughs> oh, I feel intercessions coming on me now. I've got to go. Number three, prayer will change your life. will keep changing your life. You know, once we're saved, we start on this journey of being transformed into the likeness of God. So we're going to go now to Romans 8, verse 28. And we know all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to purpose. We love that verse, don't we? But then what's the reason for it all? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's doing a job, and he's changing you into the image of his son, Jesus. He's wanting to develop fruit of the Spirit in your life. Do you know what speaks loudest to us in our lives? You know, we all want to hear the voice of God. I reckon, personally, I reckon what speaks loudest to us, forget the voice of God, no, that's okay, that's good as well, but your circumstances. See, God's always trying to get our attention through our circumstances because we know our circumstances. We feel them, we see them, we can't avoid them. You know, so they can speak. We may not hear the voice of God, but we can hear our circumstances. And the question, if you're going through some stuff, or even if you're not, you want to ask this one question all the time. Say, God, what are you trying to teach me? And what area of my life are you trying to change? What fruit of the Spirit are you after? Is it love? Is it joy? Is it peace? Patience? Long-suffering? Self-control? Goodness? Faithful? Which one? God, which one is it? If you don't ask that question, friends, you are going to be totally confused. 
in what's going on in your life. Because you'll be, all you'll be looking is for a way out and an answer, whereas God's looking for something else. He's looking for transformation into the image of Jesus. I'm so pleased that God has changed me. But what amazes me a lot is how much I still need to change. That really shocks me. And as I've been walking with God for a long time, I realized many years ago, that when God took me on, He took on a massive project. I can imagine the councils of heaven talking, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the angels gathering together and saying, God, are you, are you really sure you want to take on that guy? He, he's a big project. You're going to have to do a lot to work in his life. And God probably, you know, having all power, he said, no, no, I'm going to take this guy on. And God's been working in me and working in my life. But he's put up with so much in me. Oh, I can't begin to list the mistakes, the errors, the attitudes, the thoughts, the, the things that I've done wrong. And, you know, sometimes God still continues to bless me. I might go and preach somewhere, and there's a, you know, God moves in power. Usually after that, I think, God, did you not see what I did last week? Did, didn't you see how much I messed up there? Did you see my lack of devotion? Did you see my jealousy, God? And it's almost like God smiles and says, hey, hey I work through Fallen vessels, broken humanity, sinners. And your friends, the one couple of things that does for me, it helps me to stay humble. But also it gives me great faith. Because I think, God, you're not waiting for me to be perfect before you're going to bless me, before you're going to anoint me, before you're going to move through me, before you're going to work a miracle before me, through me. I may, I may do something wrong the week before, but God, you'll just cover for that because the blood of Jesus Christ has never lost its power. And there is perfect cleansing for every sin we may ever commit. I sometimes think to myself, if I was God, I wouldn't trust Tarkbana. I mean, I don't trust me, you know, because I, I know what's in here. It's scary. It's scary, but God and His grace and His mercy. And you know, it saves you all this sort of, when we start to be honest, you know what's going to save us from? The worst sin of all, spiritual pride. Oh, it's a stench before God. Oh, I pray more than everyone else. Oh, I lift my hands a bit higher, you know. I pray more. I read the Bible more. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in church more than ever. Yeah. Friends, that's, that's, that's lethal stuff. When you know who you really are, there's never, ever any room left for pride. Okay, the final point. Prayer is the key to transforming our community, our city, our nation. 2 Chronicles 7.14. If you've got your Bibles, have a look at it. If my people, if you know it, say it with me who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal our land. A group of intercessors decided that they were going to pray daily for an abortion clinic. And it was interesting, you know, for a whole decade, the way that they prayed was really interesting. What they did is they, they prayed blessing on everyone who walked in, and everyone who walked out, the woman who went in for abortions, the doctors who went in and performed the abortions, they just blessed everybody. They didn't curse them. They didn't do anything like that. They blessed them because they believe that whatever God blesses, He transforms into His image. And after a period of time, friends, the number of abortions in that one clinic dropped by 66.6%. Why? Because some Christians decided to pray. They realized they had access to divine power. And they thought, we're going to change this ill in our society. We're going to change this, this sickness in our community. We're going to pray. We're going to target this area and see the walls come down and God work miracles in Jesus' name. They prayed and there was transformation. You know what shocks me? What shocks me is God has left the welfare of planet Earth in the hands of of Christians and those who will pray. There's no plan B, friends. Don't, don't read the papers and complain about this, that, and the other. We are the answer. Tell the person next to you, you are the answer. Yeah. We are the answer. I think sometimes I, I need to take my responsibility more seriously. What social evil there is there in this community that you may even know of? That God is waiting for you to pray and change it. He's waiting for me to pray and change it. Like we're taking on West Auckland. That's a good start. But it's good to also narrow it down onto specifics. 
There were representatives of the body of Christ that gathered on a Saturday morning to pray at a school. Principal turned up, he asked them to pray for the pervasive violence. There'd been a rape on one of the fields. Prayed, you know, God's the answer to these things. They prayed, he asked them to pray for a release from drugs, release from um, other areas that are not good in the school, also for blessing on their reading program because it was, it was way below the required standards for that area, for the school, for learning. And also asked for a miraculous boost in the staff morale. This was a dead-end school. No morale in the, among the teachers. It was a school going nowhere. Violence, drugs, abuse. It was these group of men of God and women of God gathered on the field and they prayed. Then they started to see results the following year. First thing they saw is that the drugs, drug abuse and violence had dramatically reduced through prayer. The reading program, they say, uh, took off like a rocket. It just really progressed so well. And he said the staff returned from summer holidays more pumped up than he had ever seen them in his entire career. Drugs down, violence down, reading up, uh, staff morale up. Why? Because a group of people decided to pray specifically for that school. Maybe it's time you prayed for the school where your kids go or the school that's nearest to you and pray for a transformation taking place in that area. They say within three years, the school launched itself as a magnet school for performing arts. And listen to this. And then they became listed as a California distinguished school. So from being to the bottom, they rose to the top, not because of the principal, not because of the teacher, but Christians rose up and prayed and transformed that school. Friends, through prayer, you and I have access to divine power. With God, all things are possible. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And through prayer, we can transform our streets. Our, our, our community, our schools, the whole area, every, every society, area of society in our region, we can transform it and we can even shape our nation as we lift Jesus high above all. It is time to pray and transform our city, our community, our nation, and ultimately the nations of the world. In Jesus' name. Well, you've now heard two messages on powerful motivations to pray. I trust they have been powerful motivations, but that now not only will you have been motivated, but you'll actually get down and do some serious praying. Because if you do, you're going to see God do some incredible things in your life and in the lives of those around you. Hey, we would love to pray for you personally. Why don't you send us your prayer requests via the website on the screen and we'll get our intercessors to pray personally and individually for you and for your miracle. Join me again next week. Thanks for watching Running With Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. For more great free content, visit runningwithfire.com. You can send us your prayer requests, stream online TV and radio episodes, and view blog articles. You can also connect with Tark Barna through Twitter for regular updates. Church Unlimited meets at two locations in Auckland, New Zealand. You're welcome to come along for a visit.